Well, I took a step closer to perfection this week. It's a good week when you can do that. Uh, my big insight, the big step forward, you know, I've been working for years on how to better manage my road rage. You ever have road rage? You know what road rage is, right? Never have that? Well, my initial take on it was I always wanted James Bond's car. I forget whether it's Dr. Strange Love or Dr. No or whatever those were. Remember when he's on the scene and he's in a hot chase and it looks like the car in front of him is going to get the better of him and what does he do? He opens the little portal in the front of the car and there is a missile that he shoots and it destroys the car and all the debris. Then this is the part that I struggle with. All the debris flew over his car out to the side and nothing hit him or anybody else that we could see. Now, the struggle was that was not a perfect solution. Do you agree? I mean, if I had a missile and destroyed the car in front of me because it was being driven by someone who, in my opinion, was an idiot, that the likelihood is that the debris would come right back on my windshield or do damage to others. And as a good Christian, of course, I wouldn't want to do damage to my neighbors at all, would I? So I started thinking for years, uh, probably about the last decade, pondering the value of taking a laser approach to it. That somehow, somehow either reflecting and blinding the driver or maybe just um, causing it to burn up. Some kind of ignition fluid or something that would just melt it out of the way. Well, my big revelation this week was vaporization. <laughs> that I could vaporize those turkeys and they wouldn't be any problem. They'd just disappear. They'd be gone, eliminated, wiped out. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, you know, I don't know why I was thinking about it this week. I, I didn't have any, I didn't drive anywhere of importance. I didn't see anybody doing crazy things on the street, uh, even whether I was walking or whatever I was doing. It, it just didn't happen. So I was, why this week? And it occurred to me that I had watched, uh, we are going to see the, um, the movie about the men who are going into uh, World War II Germany to extract all the artwork. You know what the name of that is? Monument Man. And the scene, the scene that really sticks with me, for those of you who saw it or don't, there's a scene where they're going into a cave and they go into a room and there are barrels just filled with gold nuggets. And the gold nuggets were identified, I think it was by Matt Damon, they're saying, what are these? And they said, oh, those are the fillings that were extracted from the Jews. And the image was that of people who had been vaporized, all that was left were the gold fillings. It, uh, it uh, triggered, it, it also resonated with an article I read by a philosopher, Simon Critchley, about the dangers of certainty. And he talks about all these things where, where we become so sure that we're absolutely right, that I am the driver who drives the car perfectly, that when in my house, my dishwasher, I have the perfect way of loading it. Have you gone through those phases where the loading the dishwasher is the big debate about how you do it correctly? And the passion, the passion of correctness, of certainty that there is only one way to do it right my way. And he writes, and, but he draws on uh, Joseph uh, Jacob Bronowski's The Ascent of Man and has a little excerpt of, of him standing by a pond at Auschwitz. And there is the incinerator where all these people were vaporized and all that was left was the fillings and the dust that was thrown into the pond that he reached down and scooped up from the bottom. Bernowski, who said the relationship between humans and nature and humans and other humans can take place only within a certain play of tolerance. Insisting on certainty, by contrast, leads inevitably to arrogance and dogma based on ignorance. Today's gospel comes, or this, this February month, we've been reading through the fifth chapter of, of uh, Matthew, and uh, last week, it started out saying you know, that Jesus has all these, they call them the antitheses. You've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, you shall not kill, it said last week. But I tell you, but I say, 
you, if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you idiot, you will be liable to the hell of fire. Wow. All of a sudden, instead of, uh, what, what am I doing here? This anger that can be unleashed that vaporizes other people. And today, that we read that uh, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, your adversary. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why would I want to do that? Why? Is that something that you stand up and say, oh, sign me up, I'll sign up for that. And yet Jesus is so clear, that's what he is calling us to do to love your adversary and pray for those who persecute you. At the beginning of the month, it, Jesus said, uh, uh, blessed are you when you are persecuted for my name's sake. Was that a blessing? When what we really want to do is vaporize someone who is offensive to us on the road, in the street, sometimes at home, maybe more often at work. And yet Jesus says, love, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you because, so that you may be children of your heavenly Father. That's why. That if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do you? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? No, don't even the Gentiles, don't even the far, even the people are completely different. The people you look down on, everybody does that. Be perfect, he says. Be perfect. Be perfect. As your heavenly father is perfect. This idea of perfection, I don't think he's talking about a Washington, D.C. style of perfection where you go down the checklist on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being best. Perfection is 10, 10, 10, going down the checklist, whatever that is. No, it comes from, in, in the Greek, it comes from the word teleos. And teleos has the sense of being complete. That uh, in the dictionary it says that complete in your labor and your growth and your mental and moral character, that's what teleos is. It gets translated as completeness, as a fullness, as a wholeness, maybe even as a healing or help, a sense of completeness. Even the word perfection in the Latin, when Jerome translates the Bible from Greek into Latin, he uses the word perficio. To achieve, to execute, to carry out, to accomplish, to perform, to dispatch, to bring to an end. The telos is the end or conclusion, to finish, to come to some sense of completion, of wholeness, that it's all intact. And Jesus' message is, is that when you're angry at somebody, you are not whole. You are not complete. And your group cannot complete its task when one person is filled with rage, or when a group is filled with rage, it's going to be fascinating to watch the Ukraine evolve in terms of the rage that was lived out in the last week, or Syria as the rage is lived out and continues, or as our group goes to El Salvador to watch the election, knowing that even though it's 22 years since the end, since a peace accord, that the anger that people feel towards those who killed their siblings, their fathers, their uncles, is alive and well and feeds the passion that somehow is so hard to get over to designate a single person to lead a nation. The rage is real. But Jesus reminds us of two things. One is that when we are enraged, we are divided and broken. We're not whole. We're not complete. And we can't get to the end. But he also reminds us that this perfection of wholeness and completeness is the perfection of God. 
that God chooses to not be enraged with us. God chooses to love and to embrace and to hold and to heal and to claim us, not just as isolated individuals, but as people of all creation. That is God's notion of the perfect, of the complete, of the whole, and God seeks to embrace everyone and maintain that wholeness as only God can. And Lord knows, only God can, because I know the next time I'm out on 95 and somebody cuts into my lane in front of me, I am going to be enraged and I will call that person something worse than an idiot or a fool. And out of that, even though it says right here, if you say you fool, you idiot, you will be liable to the hell of fire, well, I'm really really glad that God loves me and wants to keep me wholly in the picture. And that is the gospel of the Lord for each and every one of us. God's embrace is so big that includes everyone, even me, even when all I want to do is vaporize you. Thanks be to God.